Well, we made it back in one piece. We may be a little sore today, <laughs> amen, <laughs> but I'm very proud of our mission team and the work that they did. They worked very, very, very hard this past week in a little town called Fair Bluff. In just a few moments, they're going to share with us through some testimonies and pictures a little bit of our week. But before they do, I wanted to share a little of my thoughts and a little from God's Word. This is a picture of downtown Fair Bluff, North Carolina. Have any of you ever been there before? Okay. All right. Yeah, I know y'all have been there. <laughs> Perhaps a few of you or a few of us have traveled through here to get to the beach. For most of us, we probably bypassed around it on our way. As I traveled back and forth this week, I tried to bypass as many little towns as I could. But then I started to think about this passage of Scripture that, was, that Adam and Tanner just read, and I wondered, have I maybe missed something or someone that God intended for me to see or to come in contact with, all because I was in a big hurry to get to my destination. This little town that once thrived is now nine months after Hurricane Matthew, basically still a ghost town. Some of the storefronts are boarded up. Others you can look in and still see items on the shelves as they were last October, water lines marking how high the floods came. There was a furniture store that they still had mattresses and all in it. You could see the water lines. Hardware stores with everything in it haven't been opened in nine months. Water lines all over the place. And the houses. The houses are just as bad. People. Many of the residents of Fair Bluff have been out of their homes for over nine months now. And few have hope of getting in back in anytime soon. I think there's a few other pictures of houses. These aren't the houses we worked on. These are houses that are still abandoned, boarded up, condemned. This is what we found this week. And this, I'm sad to say, is what most, if not all of us, really didn't know. All because the interest in the floods died down so quickly. The news media was there right away to cover. We all watched it. We all thank God that we were spared. But what, two, three weeks afterwards, the news media was gone. And people started to go back to bypassing the town, especially since nothing was open in it. And basically, Fair Bluff was forgotten. And yet, the people still live there. And the people are still in need. That's why this passage of Scripture has haunted me some this week, and that's why I wanted to look at it today as we share with you our experiences from the mission trip. Now, John asked us to explain the T-shirts. These were the shirts that were given to us. And they have the word filter. And this word was the theme of our evening worship times. We, they talked to us a lot about how we put filters on to keep us from being who God wants us to be. We put filters on that keeps others from seeing our true selves. We put filters on trying to hide from others and from God. But we also put filters on that keeps us from seeing others as God wants us to see them. Sometimes we do it purposely so that we don't see their suffering or be repulsed by their bad conditions. Other times we do it unknowingly, like when we bypass a town and miss out on what's going on there, miss out on their condition. Either way, we filter out what we could see and in so doing, we miss out on someone or something that God intended for us to see and to help. Sometimes, and this is the sad part, sometimes the filters even come in the form of organized religion. Let me give you an example 
from Mother Teresa's book, Words to, Lit to Love By, where she writes the following. I had the most extraordinary experience once in Bombay. There was a big conference there about hunger. I was supposed to go to that meeting, but I got lost. Suddenly, though, I came to the place, and right in front of the door, now listen to this, right in front of the door to where hundreds of people were inside talking about food and hunger, I found a man dying of hunger. I took him home, and he died there. He died of hunger. And all the while, the people inside were talking about how in 15 years we could have this much food or that much that, and yet that man died. Then she asked, do you see the difference? The difference is that in one case, well-meaning folks were talking about how to help the poor and the hungry. In the other case, someone actually helped the poor even if it was just to sit with him as he died. But more importantly than that, I think that Mother Teresa was making a big point that we oftentimes get so busy with our own blessed lives and even with our own church work that we fail to see the needs that are right on our doorsteps. That's what's happening in this scripture from Luke. The rich man, not, not a particularly bad person, was just very, very content and caught up in his own life. Donna talked about the two lives this morning in, in our opening assembly, and, and the rich man was caught up in this worldly life where he had everything. But every day he had to step over this man who had nothing, who just was begging for just a little tiny morsel of food. And as I read and thought about this story, I couldn't help but connect it to what we saw this past week where it seemed like many, including even us, have stepped right over the people there in Fair Bluff and other communities like them. There are neighbors, folks. This sign, this sign, if you can see it, if you can't come up and look at it afterwards, they had a big pole out front and they had signs with where everybody, every team was from. There was... 16 churches that came to work on this. And some of them came from Missouri and New Jersey. We were one of the closest ones. But they had where we were from and the mileage. And they had them all different point out. And they gave us the signs afterwards as a token. But you see, the thing is, they're our neighbors down there in Fair Bluff. They're on our doorsteps. They're poor and they're hungry, not only for food but for someone to care for someone to share Christ with them. And yet, how many times have we stepped right over them, hardly seeing them? Numerous times throughout the week, we were asked by our leader, why are we here, what are we doing? And what was our answer? Now wait, y'all got to do it together. All right, one, two, three. Thank you. That's what we were to do all week long. But you see... We have to see the people in order to do this. We have to not step over them, but to recognize them wherever we go, whether it's Fair Bluff or Walmart or school or work. Because folks, people who are in need are everywhere. They're on our doorsteps. And we got to make sure that we don't just step over them. So before the team comes up and share, I just want to remind us very quickly of some things that we learned from Lazarus and the rich man's story that will help us to become more aware of the people that God has placed on our steps and to be able to share the love of Christ with them in practical ways. And I'm going to give you a hint. Every one of these takes us asking God to help us because we can't do this on our own. First, we need to realize and accept that there is suffering in the world and thus there are those in need. So the first thing we need to do is to ask God to open our eyes. I wonder sometimes when reading this story how the rich man missed Lazarus. He had to step over him every single day. Even the dogs noticed him and tried to lick his wounds, the scripture says. How did the rich man miss him? Was he blind? Well, probably not physically, but spiritually. Or maybe he was just more focused on himself than on others and God. You see, here's the thing. 
when we focus on God, God will show us others to focus on too. But we have to look at God. So really, this is more of a problem of focus than of eyesight. We see, but do we focus on them long enough to realize that they need our help? Maybe, maybe we're so focused on getting our own shopping list completed when we go to the store that we fail to see the person sitting by the door who is in need. Or maybe when we drive down the highway and we get off at the exit signs and those people are sitting there and we see them, everybody sees them, but maybe we're so focused on that light and when it's going to turn green so that we can get on to our next destination that we just fail to see them. Or maybe, get ready toes, maybe we're sitting here in church, it's the end of the service, the preacher is going on and on and on and on about the needs that are out there and maybe she slips in a need of something, but you see, we're so focused on getting out, going to lunch, what we're going to eat, what we're going to do, that the need kind of goes in one ear and out the other. So the first thing we need to do is to ask God to open our eyes, and I would say ears too, to be able to see and hear the needs. But simply seeing the needy in their plight is not enough. The rich man may have actually noticed Lazarus, but he simply did nothing for him. Now, he didn't deliberately mistreat him, he didn't even have him removed. And, hey, if he wanted a few of the crumbs, then that seemed to be okay with the rich man. Yet in all, for all practical purposes, Lazarus' needs went unmet. Why? Because the rich man couldn't identify or empathize with him. His own comfortableness and wealth prevented him from understanding and thus feeling the tremendous voids in Lazarus' life. It really isn't, ironically, until he dies and everything is stripped from him. And he finds himself on one side of the great divide, and Lazarus, who had nothing, now has everything. It isn't until then that the rich man really realizes what Lazarus went through. And how ironic that he is now asking the one who wanted just a few morsels of food to dip his finger in the water and place it on his tongue for a morsel of something to drink. We've all probably heard the familiar saying, you have to walk a mile in your brother's shoes before you can understand and feel their pain. Well, we did a tiny, tiny bit of that this week. We felt the heat a lot. We had to sleep in a place that wasn't our own, in rooms with people that we're not used to sleeping with. We had to shower in trailers that were set up, set up for us that left a lot to be desired, but hey, it got the dirt off. We got sweaty. We tried to find a little tiny bit of shade underneath the trees because there was no power outside of the school and no AC. But that, we came home. We rode home in air, most of us in air conditioning. <laughs> the van needs to be fixed. <laughs> in air conditioning. We came home to houses that are air conditioned. We slept in our own beds last night. You see, we only did it for one tiny little week. And most of us rarely have to live this way. So the second thing that we have to do is to ask God to open our hearts so that we can empathize with people, so that we can begin to understand, really understand what they're going through. My hairdresser, had uh, her sister was in a horrible car accident a while back. She um, suffered multiple internal organ problems, but the large thing was that most of her body was burned. So she's in the burn center down at UNC. I was asking my uh, hairdresser about it the other day, and how she was doing, and she started to tell me, and then she stopped cutting my hair, and she looked at me. She said, you know, Cindy, I really didn't understand until I went to the beach, and I got sunburned. And she said, now every night when I lay down, my little tiny burns that caused me a little bit of discomfort have opened my eyes just a tiny little bit to what she might be going through every single day second. As we lived and worked among the people of Fair Bluff this week, I think God has been doing a little bit of this. He's been helping us to really feel what the folks down there have been going through. As we talked each night, they told me not so much about what they, this team told me not so much about what they built, but about the people they met, about the homeowners, people that just happened to stop by. Felicia can tell you, and I think she's going to tell you, every detail about the person that they helped. And I asked her one night, I said, how did you, you find that? She said, I talked to her, I asked her questions. 
See, we've got to get to know the people before we can really begin to help. Now, I'm going to stop at this point. Let's open our hearts to feel it, but the next thing and the last thing we have to do is open our hands. And I'm just going to let Ron show you the wonderful video that's made of just a few of the pictures that we had. Today, rescue crews helped dozens of families evacuate their homes in Fair Bluff. WWY weekend anchor Hannah Patrick had to leave the area just so she could make it back home safely tonight. Right now, though, she joins us live at the Brunswick Columbus County line with more on what she saw today. Hi, Hannah. Amanda, Daniel, it was absolutely heartbreaking. Rescue crews let me get in one of their trucks to ride through downtown Fair Bluff, which was completely flooded. We're going to take a look at that devastating video. The Fair Bluff Baptist Church is full of water. Downtown Hall is full of water. Houses and houses are full of water, and there are abandoned cars. Mayor Billy Hammond says it's an absolute disaster. Sherman Axelberg says she has lived there for more than 40 years, and she has never seen anything like this. She says everyone has been scrambling to save what they can, especially downtown. Every store is affected. There's not one that's not affected. Um, my, my husband has a, a business downtown and um, it was last time he went in yesterday, the water was over the top of the couch. The mayor says their goal right now is to get anyone out who needs help and then later they will assess the damage and rebuild. At this point, no one has power unless you have Brunswick Electric. There are power lines down everywhere. The mayor says they're not sure when they're going to get power back. They're hoping maybe on Sunday. Live in Delco, Hannah Patrick. Joshua said, choose ye this day whom ye will serve. I will let go of all my pride and promise to serve God, that perhaps I may be an instrument in His mighty and find joy in bringing hope and peace to all I can. I will serve Him. I will testify of Jesus Christ. I will give my whole heart in building His kingdom, sharing I will serve Him. I'll heed the call, trusting in God and His wisdom. I'll share His word, laboring the vineyards of the Lord. My heart is full with the love of God. In faith I'll teach His way. I will give all that I am. My hands are His today. I will serve Him. I will testify of Jesus Christ. I will give my whole heart in building His kingdom, sharing His love. I will serve Him. I'll not glory in myself, but glory in the Lord. Rejoicing in the light of Christ unto life. I will serve Him. I will testify of Jesus Christ. I will give my whole heart in building His peace. 
his love, I will serve him. I will serve my God. Um, the last picture up there was one of the things that came on the lunch lunches that, that George's crew had, um, and George showed it to me, and I was moved by it. And so um, here's the thing. We're back home now, and it's going to be, I don't know if we're ever going to forget it, but we're going to get enmeshed in our lives, and it's going to become easy to uh, forget that Lazarus is on our doorstep. And And... Let me remind you, Lazarus is everywhere. It's not just Fair Bluff. We were at Cracker Barrel, and, and there was a Lazarus walking through the parking lot. So we want to remember, and we want you all to remember. So what we're going to do is we're, we're going to give you a little something to take home. It sounds a little strange. We're going to give you a little bag that has that sign on it that was the last thing on the there that came from... Um, one of the churches. And inside the bag is some black dirt. It's very black dirt down there. And some of us dug in it for two days. <laughs> and um, we're going to give you this to take home as a reminder that even though we have clean beds to sleep in, washers and dryers to wash our dirty clothes, showers that really work to clean off the dirt from the day, there's a lot of people whose lives are still very dirty. They're, they're, filled, they're covered in the dirt of maybe loneliness or despair, hopelessness, maybe sin. And I want us to remember them and not forget them and not step over them. So we're going to sing, Here I Am, Lord. I'm going to speed the service up a little bit here, but we're going to sing, Here I Am, Lord. And I want you to come forward. There's two lines, Felicia, <laughs> Felia 1 and Felia 2. We've started naming them. Come on up here. <laughs> I got so tired of trying to figure out which was which. I just named them Felia. So they're going to hand you one. Form two lines like you do for communion and come up as we sing, Here I Am, Lord.